Arthur Conan Doyle was born on the 22nd of May, 1859, in Edinburgh, Scotland, the third of ten children. Destined to become one of the most important figures in the birth of modern British spiritualism, he was also, of course, the creative father of one of the most iconic fictional characters of the modern world, Sherlock Holmes. With his early life dedicated to medicine and the pursuit of his greatest passion, story writing, he was to be first published while still only a teenager in the Chambers Edinburgh Journal. Nicknamed the St. Paul of spiritualism, Conan Doyle carried the unique perspective of a man with a background in science and medicine with an equal measure of fascination in the unknown and the worlds of spirit. He never wavered in his passion to defend the possibilities of spirit, even when facing ridicule and doubt from all those around him. It was these qualities, combined with his writing on the matter, which made him such an important spokesperson for spiritualism. Sir Arthur joined the Society for Psychical Research and participated in sets of experiments in telepathy with a Mrs. Ball between 1885 and 1888. His conclusions at the time were definite to him. He felt he'd found grounds for the possibility of the psychic. Along with his membership of certain secret orders, he was also one of the founding members of the Ghost Club, a club which would go on to have many high-profile members. This enabled travel around the world at the time, where members undertook extensive private research into the occult and the paranormal. His belief in spirit communication, however, was to come later in his life. Kingsley Doyle, Sir Arthur's youngest son, died in October of 1918 after suffering terrible injuries during the First World War. Sir Arthur went to see a Welsh medium a year later, and during the sitting his son spoke to him. Sir Arthur told others of the communication and the details discussed that were totally unknown to the medium, and that it was his son's voice he had heard. His passion from this moment on became greater still. Shortly after this experience he saw family members at seances, claiming, I saw them as plainly as I ever saw them in life. After these experiences, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle became moved to shift his writings to the subject of spiritualism. The New Revelation, published in 1918, and The Vital Message, a year later, placed him firmly and openly at the heart of the modern spiritualist movement. Too many people do not seem to have time, even if they have the opportunity. Oh. So many people have no opportunity and plenty of time. <laughs> and so many people have no time nor opportunity. And the vast majority have no inclination. That's it. The tragedy of your world is that so few people are concerned with the things that really matter. Everyone finds time and makes opportunity, if possible, for the most mundane, most miserable of material things, things which to them seem on the surface so important, so vital, so necessary. One appreciates, of course, the problems of your life and the difficulties, the struggle for making a living in the ordinary way. The average person, I quite understand, has many problems to contend with. Yours is a complicated and difficult life. Your world gives many problems and the average person, no matter who he or she may be, will devote all that effort and time to striving to overcome obstacles 
Indeed, man has a nature that enables him, no matter what the setbacks, to keep on striving and struggling. But all this is invariably of the material. There are so few who are prepared to make any effort whatsoever in regard to the things that are of the spirit. Even when a key, as it were, is put in the door and turned for them, very few will in a spiritual sense make any attempt, even when the door is open, to walk through and see what is on the other side. You know, when I was on your side, I was so often distressed, so often concerned, with people who, even though opportunity was presented to them, they took little advantage of it. And if they did, even in spite of their nature, they would not willingly accept the truth, the evidence of spiritualism even some of those who took the trouble to read books or perhaps attend meetings, quite often, in spite of the fact that they themselves presented obstacles from within themselves, were presented with evidence which would satisfy any ordinary intelligent person refute it, or if they did not refute it, they would find an explanation for it, quite often more wonderful than the actual thing itself. There is such a lot that distresses one. When one strives to assist and to help people find truth, the extraordinary thing is that even those who profess to be searchers after truth, invariably by their very nature, build up barriers so the truth has even more difficulty in making itself known and understood. Even those who profess to be truly seeking spiritually, particularly those of varying Religion, religious organizations, where you would expect they would welcome truth with open arms, where you would anticipate that they would be more than delighted at substantial evidence to support their own beliefs. Even among men of high intelligence and foresight, you find that they build obstacles, barriers. Their minds are quite often so closed that you just cannot pierce the wall that they built up. And yet many of them in themselves are sincere and honest, well-meaning. When I was on your side in my work to bring spiritualism to the forefront, to interest people, and to arouse their curiosity, if you like, so that they might find something of real value, something that would be helpful to them, something that would comfort them. Quite often you would find over and over again these individuals who, having received by one means or another, proof of survival, that they would quite often dispute it, try to tear it to pieces, try to make excuses and find other explanations. When I went on my tours, when I lectured, as I did so often, and I expanded my beliefs, Occasionally, 
someone would ask an intelligent question from the audience. But more often than not, I think they came more out of curiosity to see the man who had written Sherlock Holmes. They were more concerned with seeing me to meet the person, as it were, who would arouse so much interest with his books, rather than to come and listen to my deep-founded beliefs. There were those who said that I was a fool, that I was ruining my reputation, that I was building up for myself complications which would affect the sales of my books. They would affect not only the sales of my, my books, but my integrity as a human being. <laughs> but you know, it's an extraordinary thing. When you a man of some substance, a man in a position, whether it is such as myself, or whether it be someone like Helen Swaffer, or whether it be someone like Lord Downing or Sir Oliver Lodge, the more respected you are, the more you are, as it were, put on the pedestal of public opinion and affection, the more they think you must be something of a crank <laughs> if you happen to say that you're interested in spiritualism or that you're convinced of survival. They say, oh, yes, such a clever brain, you know, such a remarkable man, but you know, of course, he's gone a little bit off his head in his old age. <laughs> a number of people that never said it to my face, but implied it in various ways, in magazines and in papers, and indeed on a few odd occasions in my audience, who suggested that perhaps uh, I'd been writing so much fiction for so long that I'd created something from my own brain in regard to this subject. <laughs> you know, people are extraordinary. If you give them what they want, they like you very much. But if you give them something that they don't want or think they don't want or something which is foreign to their nature or to their upbringing and background or if you tell them something that is against the accepted uh, beliefs whether it is in religion or in politic or whatever it is that goes against the grain they think oh well poor old thing he's a dear old thing he's contributed a great deal in his own way but now, of course, he's getting on a bit and he's gone a little bit soft. Have you ever spoken to any of these people on the earth since you've been over? Oh, I've been through and spoken at different times. And what do they think? Well, of course, now some think I'm still a bit potty. <laughs> some still think that I, it's not me. <laughs> you know, if I were to come through, if it were possible, and write a new book, or perhaps the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, uh, and though they were published, people wouldn't believe that I had come through and that I'd given them out. They would say, oh, no, no, no matter how brilliant the book may be, or even if they were better, if the book were better than anything I'd written before, they would still say, oh, no, it couldn't be, couldn't possibly be, must be some old manuscript that they've discovered and brought up that he wrote when he was on earth. Or they make some excuse, of course, in some shape or form. You know, evidence of survival is something so personal to the individual that in a sense you cannot really lay down any fast, hard rules concerning it. What is evidence to one person cannot be evidence to another. And, of course, we have to accept this. But what amazes me is that the number of intelligent, intellectual people, men of repute, who sacrificed, indeed, their good name, you might say, and their source of income, and, indeed, have given up so much of their personal life to expounding this truth, are invariably looked upon as cranks. As if we are a sort of breed of people who have all gone a little bit off 
the mark, you know. I often hear talks to to large, and I often speak to cooks and many of the other friends of mine over here, and of course we all suffered from this. And in a sense, I suppose, we're still talked about and we're still criticized. Indeed, I understand that there are still many people in your world who, though they respect and admire us for our particular work in our particular field, whether it's science or literature, uh, they still think the other aspect of our lives of which became the main interest in our lives, our interest in this great subject, this subject which should and certainly does affect every human being, this universal subject, this universal truth, they still won't accept that aspect of our interest, of our, our belief, and our great crusade, because it was a crusade. When, Do when I and when Lodge and, and all the other crooks, when all we who endeavored to, to, to expand this truth, expand this knowledge, when we tried to break down the barriers of criticism, we were beset upon by all manner of people in all walks of life, from those of religious persuasion to those who had little or none. But then, of course, in a sense, we expected it. In a sense, perhaps you might say we didn't mind. Of course we did. But at the same time, in this great crusade, and it is a crusade to bring truth to mankind, we must expect to be placed in the fury of public opinion. And I, I know full well as I look into your world and I see today, although spiritualism has advanced, it's now become respectable, which possibly in a way is the worst thing that could happen to it, because anything that becomes respectable becomes perhaps a little bit um, boring and perhaps it isn't um, particularly as interesting as it might be. When something isn't particularly accepted, people's curiosity gets the better of them and they start prying and peeping and wanting to know about it and tittle-tattle about it. But you know, when the thing becomes respectable, it no longer has the same interest for the vast majority of people. Although, of course, in a sense, there is interest, and this I, I do know, but what I feel is the trend what I feel is a great pity that so very few spiritualists are concerned with spirituality. That's so very few are concerned with discovering the possibility that, that is within each and every one. Uh, they're all concerned, or the vast majority are concerned, and not only which of course is natural, there should be interest in personal evidence. This must come before one can have conviction. But so many of them are more concerned with material things, that their dear ones and relations and friends and so on should be able to solve all their little material problems and worries and anxieties. And always they are saying to their friends on this side, now what should I do about this? And can you advise me about that? And always it's to do with their mundane material existences. In a, in a sense, I have sympathy for this, but at the same time, it seems to me the tragedy of spiritualism and that there are so few who are, con who are concerned with spiritual truth, who are concerned with spiritual knowledge, who are concerned with allowing this tremendous truth to revitalize them and make them new again to in a sense uh, so much uh, that we would like to discuss so much that we would like to talk about so much that we feel is vital and important is held back because of these souls who are brought onto a low level of consciousness or should i say a low level of, of communication because of the thought forces and the conditions which are built up with the sitters and even the mediums themselves fall onto that low level of merely being there 
to answer the material problems and questions of the average so-called inquirer. You know, when I envisaged this subject, and when I saw it for its true worth on your side, how to I receive the evidence and the comfort that was to be derived from it, I saw the immensity of it, the possibilities of it. I saw it as a great truth and it would bring the whole of mankind together. That it would break down the barriers that creeds and dogmas and politics had built over the centuries. That it would bring men to an understanding, a real realization of the purpose of life and the possibility of a life to come and how that reality of life to come could be brought, in a sense, even nearer by bringing it to some extent while yet on earth. You know, the vast majority of people, even, even though they have some knowledge of this truth, do not or seldom allow it to become too important in their lives. There is no balance. We don't expect, of course, that people in a world such as yours, which of course has changed so much since my day, and which is much more difficult a life to live, and the complexities are many and vast. But nevertheless, one would have thought that those who truly had this knowledge would have some balance in their lives where they would sort of have this realization and they would put it into practice that they would allow it to be the dynamic force behind all their thoughts and actions, that they would truly be as it were a light, you might say, in the darkness of your world. But we are constantly, constantly being disillusioned, constantly being, I won't say disheartened, but nevertheless we're still human enough to feel a sense of frustration with those whom we love so much on your side of life, who we feel should be doing so much that is vital, so much that is good. When we go into the churches and the societies and we hear the repetition of the mundane and the material, where it should be so vitalizing and so full of vitality and life of the spirit, how few churches now, it seems, have mediums or instruments who, as it were, can be taken over by the power of the Holy Spirit, be controlled and used and speak the words of the Spirit. So many seem to be on a low vibration, a vibration not very far removed from their own. There's so much astral communication. There's so much communication of a low order. There's so much that is said and done which is at variance with the truth of spirit as we understand and we know it. I think back to my own life and I realize, of course, there were and must be difficulties. I know there is much to contend with, but I know this, that if a man or a woman is prepared, if necessary, to sacrifice themselves to truth, they will not allow any obstacle or barrier to stand in their way. They will go out and they will say unto the world, this is true. This is truly truth. For I have proved it, I have found it, and I know it to so be. And this is something which you can find and prove for yourself. This is not something that depends on a book or series or group of books written centuries ago, which has been changed and altered by men, oft times for their own ends. Though the books of which we speak may have some truth, for in all things there is truth, but often it is obscured by time and ignorance, and indeed by the very thoughts and deeds of men. But behind all this, is the seed of truth, which if you give it time and opportunity, will germinate and will flower. You know, the sad thing is, when we see your world, when we see the unhappiness, when we see the misery of your world, when we see innumerable peoples who suffer, often unnecessarily, because much of your sickness and illness and disease is brought about by man himself, by his wrong thinking, by his wrong living, you know there are many things which cause us a great deal of unhappiness. 
And I think one of the things that causes us most unhappiness is that man is so intolerant, that man himself is so inclined to be self-seeking and concerned so rarely with others. Until you can sink yourself in true service and in love, you cannot hope to make any change within yourself. You cannot hope to arise above the ordinary and mundane and material condition of life in which you find yourself. Until man sees within himself the possibilities, and every man has great possibility, and every man is a spirit, and every man has the opportunity to develop the spiritual powers that lie dormant within him. Everyone has the same opportunity. I know there are many people who say, oh, well, this man has a much better background, or this man has better opportunity because of this or that, or this man has so much more money and so on. But all these things, when analyzed, all fall back to the mundane and the material. And I will go as far as to say that those who seem to have oft times the biggest obstacles are the ones who oft times have the biggest opportunities. Because until you have suffered, until you have sometimes at least felt the need for the things of the Spirit, you cannot understand or appreciate them. And it is true to say that oft times those whose tasks are many and whose path is harder, oft times they have through their very sufferings greater opportunity to reach through the sensitivity of things to the realities of the spirit because these things of which I speak are invariably revealed more to those who by suffering and complication and difficulty of life have become sensitized to truth because you cannot find truth if you live and only expect from life all that is good as the world sees it. For if you are to see the good as the spirit sees it, then truly you must have learned through suffering and have become so sensitized to other people's sufferings and have such feelings from within yourself that you yourself have made yourself more ready to receive in other words, if one wants to be an instrument or a medium, as if you like to use the term medium, you can only hope to be able to accept and understand and appreciate spiritual things when you yourself have become sensitized sufficiently. Those who go through life, or so it seems, without any undue concern or worry, those to whom life seems to present all the plums, these people are the ones who find it most difficult to understand the things that are of the mind and of the spirit. All the great teachers, all the great prophets, all the great, great seers, all the men of great wisdom, spiritual wisdom, the men who suffered. No one who wants to do the work of the Spirit must ever think that the road and the path is going to be easy. It will not be. In the material sense, often it will be most difficult, most complex. And indeed, truth, although the fun fundamental aspect is by its very nature simple, nevertheless it has its complexities. Because the human mind cannot necessarily grasp things too well or too easily. There are many things, of course, appertaining to the spirit and the realms of the spirit that cannot be fully understood any more than we can fully explain them. But I do say this, that any man or woman who sincerely seeks truth will find it. I know there will be some who criticize when they listen to this. There will be some who make excuses. There will be some who say, oh, how do we know it's him? There will be some who say, 
Oh, of course, you know, he had a cleft mouth, and it doesn't sound like his voice, but if they're intelligent, they know damn well I haven't got a cleft mouth over here. Anyway, carry on the good work, and bless you, bless you both. Good night, my dear.